little bit of background for you. Um, again, my name is Ruth. I, for many, many years, worked in the emergency department here at Demery Hospital. And recently, I got a new job, and I am the quality specialist for the medicine department, which means I get your skin occurrences, your DPH reportables, your falls. Um, I do chart reviews, grievance reviews, risk reviews. So I look at all your charting. And another role that I have here is I also do uh, education for the trauma service. I also teach TNCC. And I teach ATLS, or excuse me, not ATLS, ACLS as well. I'm also certified to teach BLS. So that's my background. So Marie is my very good friend, and she asked me to come and speak to you about shock. So we're going to do a basic overview of shock. And I know Dr. Agarwal is going to come and do a, a, a presentation about sepsis and septic shock as well. So I'm, I'm going to kind of gloss over the septic shock a little bit, but we'll go into each and every type of shock. And what do you need to do about it as a nurse? So we're going to look at the common causes uh, and symptoms of shock. We're going to talk about the, the pathophysiologic changes associated um, for, uh, with shock for your basis for assessment. We're also going to identify the nursing assessment priorities, remember how you do the ABCs and all that good stuff, plan appropriate interventions, and then evaluate the effectiveness of your interventions. So what is shock in a nutshell, without getting all technical down and dirty because, I don't know about you guys, but it was a long time ago when I went to nursing school and I didn't have to really worry about the nitty gritty of pathophysiology, right? So what is shock? It's inadequate perfusion of tissues. There's a, an oxygen supply and demand mismatch. So when we have an increased oxygen demand such as exercise, which I don't do, but exercise or um, fight or flight responses, our compensatory mechanisms kick in and help to um, provide that homeostatic uh, relationship between the acid-base balances. And again, these are effective for the minor changes if you're going to do your elliptical for 30 minutes, which again, I don't do. Um, or if you have that fight or flight, you know, you saw a tiger standing in front of me and you're running away. When you get into a shock state, is that's when your compensatory mechanisms actually fail. So there's some types of shock, right? You remember hypovolemic, obstructive, cardiogenic, distributive, and you're saying, oh my god, I can't remember that. It's been so long. What the heck? So when I was in nursing school, my husband, love him to pieces sometimes, other times not so much, but at the time said to me, what is the problem? And I said, I cannot remember the kinds of shock. This is awful. I can't do this. I can't remember this. And he said, well, what are you talking about? It's all about plumbing. So you have three parts to your plumbing. You have your tank, you have your pump, and you have your pipes. So, and he is not a medical professional at all. He is a custodian. I love him to pieces. But he's a custodian. He has a lot of... Um, experience doing electronic electrical plumbing woodworking that kind of stuff and he said to me it's all about the plumbing that's what shock is it's all about the plumbing and I said honey that's why I married you because you're a genius and he said yeah I know and I said no actually I married you because you're cute so is it the tank is it the pump or is it the pipes so when we talk about the tank the tank is empty if the tank is empty you're not gonna be able to take a shower if you can't take a shower then you smell and you get dirty and nobody wants to be with you so right so if the tank is empty there's nothing for the the pump or the pipes to work with so what kind of things cause the tank to be empty volume. the volume okay so like what what kind of issue would you have if you don't have much volume Bleeding, dehydration from vomiting, from diarrhea, from burns, from heart failure, extravasation into the tissues, third spacing, all that good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the treatment goal? It's to fill the tank, okay? So now we go on to the pump. The tank, we just filled the tank, isn't that wonderful? But the pump is not working right. So if the pump is not working right, it's again not going to get the oxygen to the tissues that you need. It's not going to pump the blood through. This is non-hemorrhagic shock. It's, it's obstruction or prevention of the function of the heart or the great vessels. So common causes would be, in, in my old role, tension pneumothorax, biggest cause. 
Cardiac tamponade, biggest cause. And those are the two main mechanical causes. With tension pneumothorax, you're having pressure on the heart and the great vessels. The pump can't work effectively to get it out. Likewise, um, with cardiac tamponade, there's fluid in the, in the pericardial sac, and without, with the, the increase in pressure, the, the pump can't expand and contract properly. And what's the treatment goal is to relieve the obstruction. So cardiogenic shock, we're talking about the pump still. The pump is failing. Blunt cardiac trauma, baseball bat to the chest, baseball to the chest, steering wheel to the chest, punch to the chest. MI, the, the lack of blood to the tissues through obstruction and inclusion. Dysrhythmias, if they're in VTAC, if they're in uh, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, you're really not getting that um, proper filling and uh, ejection of blood. And drugs, obviously if they have overdoses of certain things, like say grandma decided to take, she thought she took her low presser, um, she forgot that she took her low presser once, she took it again, she forgot to took it a second time, she took it a third time, she took it a fourth time. She took, by the time somebody figures it out, there's an issue, right? So she's overdosed on her low presser. It's not always the heroin or the narcotics, which it could be, but it's not always that. And what is our treatment goal? We're going to use uh, pump support. We're going to give them meds. We're going to give them positive inotropic medications. We're going to give them all sorts of good stuff to make them feel better. So now let's go on to the pipes. So we talked about the tank. We talked about the pump. Now let's talk about the pipes. So there are three types of warm shock. Anaphylactic, uh, what, uh, septic, and I couldn't remember which order I put them in. Anaphylactic, septic, and neurogenic. Anaphylactic, very self-explanatory anaphylactic reaction to medications, bee stings, anything. What happens is histamine release causes massive vasodilation. The pump, the um, blood can't get back to the pump to get throughout out the whole circulate, circulatory system. So the fluid shifts from the intravascular space to the interstitial okay. spaces and you're not getting that volume back to the heart. Septic shock, again, I know Dr. Agarwal is going to speak um, to it uh, a little later, but um, when, uh, when you have massive, and we'll get into it a little bit more in, in a minute, but when you have a massive inflammatory response, neutrophils go, cause cellular death, which causes the endotoxins and the exotoxins to come out of the cell, attacks the body, um, that causes vasodilation as well. Again, the pump, the pump is working, the tank is working, but the pipes can't get the blood back to the heart. And neurogenic shock, if they have a spinal cord injury, they can't, um, again, the vasodilation, there's no sympathetic tone, the sympathetic nervous system doesn't work on your extremities. And what's the treatment goal? Volume support, replacement, and vasoconstriction. Again, vasoconstriction being key because the tank is already full, so you can't just keep giving fluid, it's not gonna help you. What's gonna help you is giving vasopressin, or uh, other vasopressors that you, or other uh, pressors that can help increase your blood pressure and clamp down on those uh, the vascular system. So when we talk about shock, we also talk about cardiac output, and I hated cardiac output, uh, cardiac output, <laughs> stroke volume. How do you how do you do it? How do you remember it? Well, stroke volume is the volume of blood in the ventricles ejected with each contraction, and the components are preload, pre afterload, and contractility. So preload, the blood's coming back to the, to the heart from the uh, vascular system. Afterload is the diastolic atrial blood pressure, arterial, not atrial, excuse me, di diastolic arterial blood pressure, and contractility is how well is the pump actually working. And illness and injury can affect any and all of those three parts. So when you see somebody who's initially in, in the first stages of shock, and we'll go in the stages in a second, but in the first stages of shock, it's kind of mild. You can't really don't see really those dramatic changes like, oh my God, he's hypotensive, tachycardic, holy crap, what do we do? They're more subtle changes. The little old lady, she's you know kind of a little bit more confused, and is she sundowning or is she in shock? You see the blood pressure start to go down a little bit. It's not too, it's not going to make you go, oh my God, she's in shock if she's from 120 over 80 to maybe 110 over 70. But those, as you trend those vital signs and you to trend the patient's mental status, you can start to see a little bit of a difference in the subtle changes. So some of the compensatory mechanisms that, that we, mechanisms that we talk about are baroceptors and chemoreceptors. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember how these work, but I'll, in a nutshell, tell you what they are. Baroreceptors 
respond to the stretch of the organ and or uh, vasculature. So in the heart, if your um, heart is stretched too much, it releases BNP, which is beta neutron peptide, which is indicated for CHF, right? You're looking at the BNP if you're looking for heart failure. Well, that's what that's a, uh, uh, that's released because of the baroreceptors uh, response. Chemoreceptors um, respond to the oxygen carbon dioxide mismatch. So, if you have decreased carbon dioxide and increased O2, that's great for a short period of time. But after a while, the chemoreceptors say, "Hey, wait a second, something's going on. The, the CO2 is no longer in, within normal limits. It's now 20 instead of 35." So then they activate. And again, failure to recognize and treat shock leads to cellular destruction and organ failure and death. Not to be um, a party pooper, but that's terrible. So some more compensatory mechanisms. We're going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty, but some of the things that we talk about when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, it's coming from the adrenal gland. So you have your epi and your norepinephrine that actually release to um, stimulate the heart to increase contractility, work the heart better, make the pumps, the pump, um, each beat a little bit more stronger, a little bit more effective, increases the heart rate to get that blood pumping, gliogenolysis, so we break down the sugar, get ready to fight or flight, we got to have extra sugar in our system to get those muscles to move, and it opens up the airway, so it, there's um, that fight or flight, so we get ready when the respiratory system, which we'll talk about in a second, but when the respiratory systems come along, get come online, our airway is open and we're ready to go. We also have the systemic inflammatory response. So that's affected by tissue hypoxia and it sells, sends the neutrophils to the injured site. And isn't that wonderful? Except if it's ongoing for hours, days, that's a bad thing. It's actually no longer protective and it's actually more harmful. It worsens end organ failure. We talked about um, the systemic inflammatory response causing cellular death. After a while, all those neutrophils activate cellular death thing, like the, the, the wall of the cell pops, apoptosis, causing death, and everything that's in that cell goes out to the environment that it's in. So it affects the liver, the lungs, and the kidneys first. So you're going to see kidney failure first. You're going to see LFTs are going to start going through the roof, and they're going to go into respiratory distress and or failure. The pulmonary response, again, acting by, activated by acidosis and hypoxia, uh, causes hyperventilation. Why? Because we want to get more, initially we want to get more oxygen in and blow off that CO2. This tries to uh, reverse any acidotic state that they have. So when we talk about the cerebral response, the autoregulation, I'm sure we all remember autoregulation. I hated autoregulation because we have to remember this, right? So autoregulation, there's only three things allowed in your, in your skull, okay? It's your brain, it's blood, and it's cerebral spinal fluid. There are no oxi there's no oxygen reserve, there's no uh, glucose reserve. So what the brain gets is what the brain gets. So there's no way for the brain to say, huh? Uh, okay, I have a little fat in my left lobe. I'm just going to dissolve that and use that for energy real quick. It doesn't work like that. The um, blood that it gets is what it uses. It gets all the nutrients from. When the blood pressure drops below 50 millimeters of mercury, there is no ability for the brain to compensate. The, again, there's no cerebral perfusion. They can't, it can't get the oxygen and the glucose that it needs. So then it starts to fail and you're starting to get um, cerebral ischemia and uh, ultimately cerebral death. Uh, and then the renal response, uh, when the kidneys start saying, hmm, well, blood pressure's 80 and I'm really not getting all the blood that I should and it's not as good as I should get it. So there's something wrong. So I'm going to start holding on to sodium and water, and I'm going to retain that, and I'm not going to let any of it out. So you're going to see a decrease in urine output from that. And what happens is the, um, the renal ischemia causes the adrenal gland to secrete renin. When renin 
secretes angiotensin 1, it turns into angiotensin 2 in the lungs with ACE convert the uh, ACE um, angiotensin converting enzyme. That stimulates aldosterone, which again, sodium reabsorption, water reabsorption. And all these, over time, increase systemic blood pressure. So it is a compensatory mechanism, it's just slow in getting there. The hepatic response is one of the last things that happen. So what the liver says is, huh, well, the, the respiratory system didn't work, the inflammatory response didn't work, the kidney response didn't work. So I guess it's my turn. This is very bad because what happens is the liver says, well, the heck with it. Everything else is failing. I'm going to just go throw out my last throat and it's going to be clotting factors. So it's going to start that clotting cascade. The clotting cascade, again, is very bad. It will start to put, to put the person into DIC, which everybody knows means death is coming. <laughs> so DIC, disseminated infrascular, blah, 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 death is coming. So that is very bad. So if it gets to the hepatic response, you're almost into all, all uh, end organ failure. Three types of shock. There's compensated, progressive, and irreversible. Compensated is if you're running down the road because the tiger is chasing you, your body is able to keep up with those metabolic demands, so the oxygen and carbon dioxide mismatch. Second is progressive. The compensatory mechanisms start to fail. This is where you're going to see the tachycardia. This is where you're going to see the low blood pressure. This is where you're going to see um, the decreased urine output. If we do not treat that, and if we don't recognize that and say, oh, she's just um, you know, freaking out because um, she didn't get her pain meds on time and she's hyperventilating because of that, and we don't treat that, it could end up in irreversible shock, which is end organ failure and death. Again, compensated. Some assessment data that you would see, some slight changes in mental status, nothing really to, to call home the mother about, but you know, a little bit, maybe she's a little bit more confused, or maybe he's not, you know, he's 30 years old and he's not acting quite right, but maybe he's just weird. Who knows? The systolic blood pressure is going to be within normal limits. You're going to see a little bit of a rise in the diastolic pressure. So they're 120 over 80 four hours ago when you check their vital signs, right? So then you go and you check their vital signs again, and he's 120 over 96. Okay, that's not out of normal limits, but it's a little bit higher. You're going to get a bounding pulse. The heart is starting to work, starting to get going, and saying, hey, come on, got to get all those nutrients. And you're going to see that decreased urine output, that fight or flight. I got to hold on to my pee because I can't pee while the tiger is chasing me. So the compensatory mechanisms start to fail. So what are we going to see? We're going to see the marked mental status changes. We're going to see that 40-year-old um, woman all of a sudden, you know, not recognizing her kids or not recognizing her husband, although sometimes I don't want to recognize my husband. I understand that. You're going to see a decrease in the systolic blood pressure. This is where you're going to start to see the lowering blood pressure. You're going to start to see that narrowing pulse pressure, tachycardiac with weak pulses. Because remember, for the most part, shock is that clamping down of the peripheral vascular system so that you have that weak, thready pulse. The fingers are starting to get a little cool to touch. They're going to be a little bit clammy. And if you're doing a serial labs, you're going to look at the, um, you could look at the serum lactate, which uh, indicates metabolic acidosis. So when we talk about irreversible shock, oh dear. So you talk about um, the cellular ischemia with multiple organ dysfunction. So we didn't treat the woman because we thought she was freaking out because she wasn't getting her pain medication. Ha ha, just kidding. Now she's obtunded. She's unresponsive. She's marked hypotension, now she's 60 over 30. She's now bradycardic because you know, the heart feels like, I, I give up, try, can't help it. And now she's gonna have some dysrhythmias with it. So you might have uh, some PVCs, some PACs, hypoventilation. Now the respiratory says, well, psh, heart's not working. I'm not gonna work either. What's, what's the point of me working? You're gonna have kidney, liver, and heart failure. It's gonna be um, pretty, uh, if it's uh, over a long ter period of time, it's going to be pretty significant. You're going to see that discoloration of the urine is going to be brown. Maybe you don't have even 30 cc's an hour of urine. And of course, again, the worsening serum lactate, which is really, 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 really bad. Because the worsening serum lactate tells me that you're in worsening metabolic acidosis, which then triggers the liver, you remember before, triggers the liver to um, 
send out that clotting cascade. So when we talk about um, management strategy, strategies, the first thing we talk about is damage control. So if they're bleeding, obviously we're going to stop the bleeding. And one of the newer um, uh, uh, medications that they use, especially in the trauma uh, arena, is TXA. It's an antifibrolytic. Um, we give that as indicated. Um, it's still quite new in its use, so we don't really like to use it unless it's um, unless it's dire. Uh, we want to make sure that we stop the bleeding. If it's external bleeding, that's great. If it's internal bleeding from a trauma, such as a spleen lack or a fractured kidney, fractured liver, that we go and take them to the OR and fix it. If it's the slow insidious bleed, like the GI bleeder that's just pooping current jelly stools everywhere, you can't really stop that. So what you want to do is you want to support them. You want to give them, and we'll talk about it in a second, but we want to give them blood. We also, if they have a, a warm shock and we're giving vasopressors, we're not, going to make sh we're not going to make their blood pressure go all the way to 130 over 9 day. We want to keep them around 100 systolic because we don't want to go from one extreme to the other extreme. We want to replace the lost volume, so either we use IV fluids judiciously or we give massive transfusion protocol. And I, I don't know how familiar with the, that you are. Is anybody familiar with tra massive transfusion protocol? So my understanding is, from Marie yesterday, is that you don't have um, you don't have uh, access to that on the regular PCU or regular medical units in the emergency department and ICU. What happens is somebody comes in that's critically ill. They're a trauma patient. They're a GI bleed. They're um, uh, trauma patient, GI bleed, stroke patient, and they're bleeding out everywhere. What we do is we activate the mass transfusion protocol. So if you see you hear a trauma code go overhead, that means the lab automatically is sending up a cooler full of untyped, uncrossed blood. When they're on the inpatient unit, it's nice because they already have those um, types and crosses already done, so they don't have to re-verify it. But in an emergent situation such as a trauma or um, uh, bleeding for some uh, uh, GI bleed or anything like that, they call for this cooler, and what's in the cooler is packed red blood cells, platelets, and um, fresh frozen plasma. So they give one to one to one. They give platelets. They give excuse me. They give blood cells, platelets, and then plasma. So you don't want to give four or five units of red blood cells and not give any platelets and not give any plasma because then it gives a big shift in the in the in the blood. They also talk about and a lot of resources and a lot of uh, places that you look, they also talk about autotransfusion. So what autotransfusion is, is if somebody comes in, say, with hemothorax, and they put in a chest tube and they're draining out the blood, they have um, equipment that takes that blood and puts it back into the body. So you get your own blood back from your hemothorax. In the almost 11 years that I've been in the emergency department, I have never once seen this. If somebody has an emergent issue and they need a chest tube, or if somebody has an emergent issue and they need blood, we get untyped, uncrossed blood, and, and they get it. So I've never seen it done, but it is still being talked about. Again, we're going to give isotonic crystalloid fluids. We're going to give normal saline. We're going to give lactate. We're going to give lactate ringers. We're going to give um, judiciously the IV fluids. So yes, you could give boluses, but you're no longer going to um, do uh, normal saline liter after liter after liter after liter because all you're doing is just diluting the blood. So nursing care of the patient in shock. So when you do an assessment, you want to get a full health history. You also want to get med, med rec because I know med rec is a big touchy subject, but med rec, what happens is when you do your assessment and you say to the patient, what kind of medical problems do you have? Do you have heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, kidney issues, liver problems? They said, oh, no, I don't have any health history. Okay, so what medications are you on? Well, I'm on low pressure. Why are you on low pressure? Because I have high blood pressure. So you have high blood pressure. Well, no, I take low pressure. Okay. Do you have any, you know, any other, so what other medicines do you take? Well, I take insulin. Oh, you have diabetes? Well, I take insulin. So no. Well, you take insulin. So let me get this straight. You take insulin. Why do you take insulin then if you don't have to? Well, I take it for my diabetes. So you have to do med rec just to get sometimes that adequate, or the, excuse me, not adequate, but uh, full medical uh, history. 
You want to look for mental, mental status changes. You're going into talking to your patient an hour later, you go back and they're, not, they're a little bit more screwy than they were when they came in. You're going to do a full set of vital signs as per protocol. I know that there are different kind of protocols, once a shift, every four hours, however the doctor orders it, but you want to make sure that you do a blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation level, and a temperature. The temperature is very important. I know a lot of times when I worked in the emergency department, the tech would go and take their, their temperature and they would come back with 95.2 oral. Well, if they were 95.2 oral, there's an issue, so I need to do something about that. They're not really, are they really hypothermic? If they're hypothermic, that's a problem because hypothermia causes clotting, which causes DIC, which causes bad things to happen. So I want to make sure they're normal thermic. So if the tech is actually documenting 95.2 and I see that when I'm reviewing their blood pressure and whatnot, we need to go back and retake the temperature and make sure that it's not out of those uh, normal limits. We're also going to do cardiac monitoring if necessary. They have, uh, I know they have the war room and they're, they have techs that look at everything, but we're also going to look at our serial rhythm strips, make sure that they started off in AFib with um, a rate of 80 and now they're in AFib with a rate of 120, there's an issue there. Do a full head to toe assessment, you're going to make sure that their, you know, their, their uh, skin is intact, they have no obvious areas of bleeding, that they're, um, they're not having diarrhea everywhere, that's getting blood everywhere. You want to check their output, not only their urine, but also any NG tubes, any drains that they have, any chest tubes that they have. Serial lab values, obviously, you're going to be looking for your HNH, your lactate levels, your white blood count, your platelet count, all that good stuff. You're going to need IV fluid replacement. Again, you have to be really careful, especially if it's a warm shock, you don't want to overflow them, overload them with fluids, rather, um, that you want to give it to just judiciously, but if they're bleeding and they need a bolus, that's absolutely fine. You're going to check their skin for color, temperature, and pulse changes, and Karen said, did you say something about skin assessment? So make sure that you check their bottoms because she'll kill me if I didn't tell her, because I didn't tell the last group yesterday. She was like, what? So what are we going to do for people who, think, who we think are in shock? We're going to give them oxygen. Everybody gets oxygen. Can't hurt, right? A little bit of oxygen never hurt anybody. Now, yesterday, Marie and I came up with a great idea. We're going to start selling oxygen, and it's going to be different flavors. I guess they do that in the city now, New York City, right? So why not? We'll give everybody oxygen. It's free, sort of. We're going to treat any dysrhythmias as indicated. So if you see that they're in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response, maybe you're going to give them a little bit, little bit of cardizem or a little bit of low pressed arm. You're going to monitor the, any IV, the IV site for signs and symptoms of infiltration, which you guys are doing a great job at. You're going to give those IV fluids judiciously, again, um, administering blood products as soon as possible it's, if it's uh, recommended. You're going to give any meds as ordered and monitor for side effects, so you're not going to give Levofed and walk away. Not that you would give Levofed, but you're not going to give a presser and just say, eh, I'll check back with them in four or five hours, see how it works for you. Um, you're going to get the serial lab work we talked about before. We're going to monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of bleeding, such as a guaiac or a hemocult. You're going to do gastrocult as well. And you're going to do close monitoring of all output, NG tube, urine, chest tube strains, etc., and keep the patient warm and dry. Because if the patient is sitting in urine, the patient's going to get hypothermic because they're just leaching that, blood, that uh, body temperature right away. So again, shock is inadequate perfusion of tissues. We need to early, have early identification and treatment of the shock because that will improve your outcome. Because if you, if you ignore it and say, eh, whatever, they're going to end up in irreversible shock, and un unfortunately, they're going to go into multi-organ system failure and end up dying. And again, just remember the plumbing, pipe, tank, or pump. If you can remember what those three things and be like, hmm, what's the problem here? You'll be able to fix the patient. Any questions? Yes? You mentioned warm shock. Mm -hmm. So warm shock is the three types of shock. There's anaphylactic shock, there's septic shock, and there's neurogenic shock. What happens is instead of having the, the sympathetic nervous system giving you epi and norepi to clamp down on the peripheral vascular system to get the weak thready pulses in your, your extremities, um, have that massive vasoconstriction to get the heart back to the, the um, pump, the mediators that are responsible for th those three types of shock have massive vasodilation. So you're not going to see the cold, clammy extremities. You're going to see warm blood pooling. 
in their arms and their legs, and that's why we call that the warm shock. So they're not going to be cold and clammy, and they're not going to have that. Um, you ever see a patient, a person with like Raynaud's when they go in the cold and their fingers get like that? That's kind of what happens in a shock state when you're talking about massive vasoconstriction. In uh, those three types of shock, it's massive vasodilation, which is why it's a pipe problem, which, why, which is why you can't give them fluids because it's not going to help them. What's going to help them is giving a vasoconstrictor and getting that blood back to the heart. Welcome. Any other questions? No? Yeah? All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And again, I am the quality and uh, patient safety officer for your area. So if you need anything, if you have a concern or question or anything like that, just stop by 5 South. My name is Ruth. Marie can get in touch with me. Bill, go and turn your report. Woo!